Well, thank you very much. I'd like to take the opportunity now to open the floor to uh, the audience. Yes, please. please. The, the, over there? Oh, okay. I, I saw the lady first. That's okay. That's fine. You can go ahead since you've got the mic. <laughs> Please go ahead. The gentleman. Yes. Hello? All right. Uh, after, uh, good afternoon. Um, as far as I know, uh, there are industrialized uh, countries that have um, a strict policies written, in quotes, written, uh, to protect its citizens um, from discrimination, discrimination and that, uh, which includes race, gender, age, religion, uh, sexual orientation, etc. But at this point I would like to challenge uh, the panel uh, and maybe a few of the audience and to just assume for a second that you just lost your job uh, and put yourself in a position where, for example, the panel, if you go out, um, out of the street here, um, let's put an example, the U.S. or any other industrialized country, um, with your resume, resume or CV under your arm and, uh, and, put this, and, and let's put, put, you, put yourself in the same scenario in a country in development. Where would you think that you will not be discriminated against your age? Because as developing countries, unfortunately, um, age discrimination is a very serious issue. If you are age 35 or 40, um, chances are that you will not find employment if you have no connections or, or, is, or a good networking environment. Also, we'd like to hear uh, the ILO, from the ILO. If ILO uh, promotes and enforces rules uh, to targeting uh, these uh, practices of uh, discrimination uh, in countries, especially in development, developing countries, and also from the World Bank, um, if it's enforcing somehow or promoting uh, within their projects to uh, to have uh, or to go against uh, discrimination practices um, in those projects. Uh, thank you. Sure, Alex Lara, World Bank. Okay, thank you. I'm <coughs> sorry, I'm Pierre Lapache from the World Bank too. And I have two questions, if you allow me. The first one is very much more focus on the report itself, and the second one is more general. The one on the report, there is a lot of empirical evidence from previous crises that suggests that uh, packages of interventions work much better than individual interventions. A lot of the results we've seen actually look at individual interventions. I was wondering whether you also thought in terms of analyzing whether this pack these policies were coming as packages and how coherent those packages were in the different countries. The second one, which is the more general one, there's a sentence I love that people continue to repeat and sort of attribute to different people. I don't know who said it, but it's never to waste a good crisis. And uh, uh, I, I love because I think it's useful. And I was wondering whether with a I or sort of looking at this crisis in five years' time on the basis of what you've seen from your report, Will you say that this crisis has been wasted from the point of view of reducing vulnerability on the labor market, or not, and why? Thank you. Um, I'm going to take four questions and then revert back to the um, to the audience. There's a in front here, yep. and and then I'll come to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'd like to invite the panel to juxtapose two issues. One is the very significant decline in the share of manufacturing in GDP since the turn of the century, which was the decade in the last, and which seems to have been accelerated by the crisis. And the only exception seems to be Germany, 
So given that the report finds, or at least the very early finding is, that in the advanced economies, perhaps less of the stimulus went towards manufacturing, it, would you say that that is something that perhaps now needs correction? Or, you know, since the looking ahead points towards better targeting, etc. But certainly the decline in manufacturing does seem to be not necessarily inevitable. If it was inevitable, it was just, if it's simply a question of moving on from manufacturing to services, then Germany surely would not be doing it. The point is that some countries have got a decline in manufacturing, but not Germany. So I'd like to invite the panel for their reaction to that. Thank you. I'll take the fourth question and then refer to Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I'm Merle Ratner from the International Commission for Labor Rights. And I had a question in the United States and I think some other countries. Uh, there's been an attempt to use the crisis to basically gut core labor standards and particularly freedom of association and collective bargaining rights for workers. And I wonder if you could talk about the impact that that has on the social dialogue and on improving the employment situation because that's clearly for, for workers here a very, very uh, urgent question. And I think it is in other countries as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, I'll just take speakers by order and then you can decide which ones you'd sure. like to answer. Yes, Peter? Um, yeah, I have the very, very good questions. Um, look, that, let, let me respond to a couple of them because um, there, there probably isn't time to respond to all, but the um, the, the first gentleman who raised the uh, the question of discrimination to, uh, to increasing with the crisis, and I, I would link that to the the question uh, we just had about um, um, core labor standards being being undermined. I, I I think I mean anecdotally, yes, we have I mean anecdotal documented individual cases in many countries. Yes, I mean one has the impression that it's increasing. Um, you know, um, whether it be violations of right to organize child labor, which, you know, when you look at it logically, um, employers seeking to reduce their labor costs, you know, child labor is an option in some, some contexts where it's not well, um, where, where it's not well uh, prohibited or in, in practice. Uh, discrimination against women workers paid less than men. Um, uh, you know the the I mean, one uh, impression I had about the com the the document is in fact it 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 does deal with um, uh, rights and standards, but it looks at what legislate do the legislative changes have been made um, entail violations of those standards, and it finds only a couple of examples I think. But really, what counts and what what both of your questions are is what's happening on the ground, and are we um, are we actually trying to counteract that? And, you know, the second last point I think raises it there because probably the impression of uh, the ILO and the World Bank has said that probably isn't, and, and we would fully agree with that. Um, so, uh, yes, by all means, I think it is a phenomenon, and yes, it does re re require responses, and it's not just a matter of ensuring that your laws don't, vi don't say um, you can now violate the standards. It's actually increasing the the surveillance um, but what what impact has on the national dialogue uh, which is the other part of the the last questions I think it does have a detrimental impact like we, um, um, last week we we actually had a one day uh, discussion um, Chatham House rules was with another international financial institution in Washington which wasn't the World Bank so I'll let you guess <laughs> and um, you know we noticed that in in many countries uh, this institution had actually uh, recommended uh, dismantling um, collective bargaining systems um, and in in a few countries we see the rate of collective bargaining coverage just dropping almost through the floor um, this was done in the spirit or the logic of um, um, making um, uh, individual enterprises more competitive. But in effect, in many, uh, many European countries in, in particular, but not just there, the practice is to have sector level bargaining. So when you say that's finished, there is no more collective bargaining. Right? And everything that that entails, including protecting workers uh, against uh, individual abuse and 
discrimination and and uh, everything else. So they they are very concerning uh, or preoccupying developments. And I would certainly invite the ILO and the World Bank to to uh, to, to pursue the the, the work. Uh, on that, just one last question, um, if I may, a response, which is on the question of uh, decline of manufacturing. Yes, it struck me too that you know there's a figure near the beginning of the report. Um, 2.4 trillion dollars was put into different kinds of stimulus. 2.4 trillion. Um, of that, one half or a bit more went to the financial sector. Um, very, very much smaller fraction to manufacturing, and even less to things like education. There is an imbalance there, yeah. and um, um, you know, uh, I mean, one hears that well, you have to, without a financial system, nothing functions. But you know, did, did you really need to? Um, you, you know, there are countries um, that did a little, more, did a lot more to, in fact, ensure that the financial sector. Uh, maybe shrink, um, have less influence on the real economy because I think you know if you look at the source of the crisis, um, that's where the problem is. And I think it was you know I, I found it very funny. I mean, some here in the U.S., some uh, you know many people criticize the bailouts of the auto companies, but bailing out Wall Street, well, that's okay. You know that that makes no sense to me because ultimately, yes, you do want to protect. Uh, you know, real jobs that produce real goods, real services that benefit people, and um, and it's perfectly legitimate, I would think, and to to do that. And uh, it's it's deplorable, in fact, that uh, that that's being reduced, which is why, and I'll end on that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chair, uh, is that um, um, why we think, uh, given you know the the climate crisis and and. Uh, um, and all the challenges on that side, um, that there should be a global effort to invest in the green economy uh, to attack both the, 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 the climate change, um, da dangers of climate change, and they're immensely um, creative of employment. We, we have, a, in fact, a detailed report. Uh, we looked at six specific countries. If you invest so much money, how many jobs they create? <laughs> Um, so please have a look at it. Um, it's www.ituc.csi.org. Hyphen CSI.org. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jürgen. Um, uh, for me, it's it's not really one can't really criticize that the big bulk of the support went go went to the uh, to the financial sector because the house was burning and. Uh, I mean, uh, the financial sector is the brain of the economy. It's not like any other uh, sector. It has much more systemic uh, uh, implications for the economy. So that's not really the point. The point is perhaps uh, more uh, the role of the financial sector, uh, how it has evolved over the last uh, 20 years in our economies. And perhaps that Germany is in a in a slightly different uh, position because it's true that uh, in Germany the the manufacturer sector is still quite uh, quite big uh, 25% 30% or something like that uh, and um, uh, there uh, I, I think there are many points uh, to criticize the German model uh, but there are also strengths and perhaps one strength is uh, the more uh, longer-term orientation of the economy, and when one could uh, quote a lot of uh, uh, specific uh, aspects uh, why the economy is perhaps a little bit more oriented on on, on the longer term, shareholder value, uh, the industrial relations, the, the close cooperation between the banks and uh, uh, local banks and uh, the industrial sectors and the small and medium enterprises. So there is much more of that, and. This perhaps is one issue why in Germany uh, the manufacturer uh, uh, sector is quite big and, and quite strong. And uh, we are very dependent on exports, which gives really a fluctuation to the economy. But the, the, on, the un, on the other hand, we are less uh, dependent on the financial sector. Uh, we are perhaps less uh, dependent on, on that. And perhaps that's a, a strength. And, uh, uh, one can also uh, learn uh, from from it. And then I would like to, to come back to one other point, 
uh, it is the question how to react in terms of labor mark, uh, market policies when you are in the midst uh, of, of the crisis. I think uh, it's not uh, the tight cut autonomy between uh, flexibility or not flexibility. I think you need flexible, you need a flexible system. But uh, it depends, the reaction depends a lot, uh, I think that's also what uh, Martin Rama said, on the nature of the crisis. Uh, if you are in a, in a normal business cycle a crisis, then uh, there is the, the creative destruction and it's, you have to support workers, of course. But when you are in another type of crisis, and often with developing countries, it's like that. You, you have the contagion uh, issue and then uh, it comes over a country and it's, it's, it's not a business cycle of the country. It comes uh, over a country and then... Uh, I think there is more argument uh, to react in this way, to protect also uh, the, the assets in terms of, of human uh, resources. Uh, is that it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rani, would you like to add anything? Uh, well, okay, I'll respond. respond to some of this. Yeah. I'll respond to two questions that haven't been addressed. Um, first of all, Sir, I assure you, if I walked out on the street of Washington, D.C. with my resume under my arm, I would suffer from age discrimination, and probably rightly so, because the, I worry much less about my age cohort than my granddaughter. So the issue, I think, if we're going to talk about discrimination in an age context, is not so much the 40-year-old. That may well be a problem. But we all have to worry about young people, young people entering the workforce and youth unemployment for obvious reasons that I certainly don't have to get into. Um, and I think one thing to say about that is that we're not going to tackle the youth unemployment problem or the empl employment of the near elderly or of the middle aged unless we tackle employment as a whole, the economy has to be working to be creating jobs, sustaining enterprises um, uh, before we're, we're going to get our arms around that. So that, that's uh, the first point. Secondly, on don't waste a great crisis or a good crisis, if there is such a thing. I think there's two ways in which we hope that these crises, which are um, having such terrible impact on people's lives are not wasted. The first is in regulation. Um, and we've seen uh, in, in this country and, and elsewhere waves of, of uh, regulation. Maybe the jury is still out as to whether it's enough, whether it's too much, whether it's smart. But that's, that's one way we hope we're not wasting the crisis. And the second way is in tackling some of the structural uh, issues uh, that um, uh, uh, plague economies. Um, and I think that's, here, here's where the debate between austerity and growth and getting that balance right uh, comes into play. Because if all you do is, is slash your budgets um, and not tackle some of the structural issues in the economy, then um, certainly there's going to be uh, a, a big a negative impact on growth, and you're going to get into a, a, a death spiral. Thank you. Martin? Just <clears throat> one word to connect two of the questions, the question by Mazam on manufacturing and the question on discrimination, uh, because I think they, they provide uh, perhaps a, a good illustration of what you call the, the framework of the, the World Development Report. I think we all pay attention to manufacturing because of this presumption that there is something good about jobs in manufacturing. Um, otherwise, one would say, well, it's one digit in the list of production of goods and services in the economy, so why, what is so special about them? Um, and I think it's this presumption that there are more things that happen through jobs in manufacturing. There is more learning. There is uh, something that is related to growth and to human capital accumulation. The apprenticeship model of Germany is very much also in manufacturing. And, um, and I think there is a point to it, uh, although it's a point that, again, doesn't go on the ISIC classification. Because if you take Bangladesh as a developing country, you say, well, garment 
uh, was quite transformational in Bangladesh in many ways, but Jude Mills perhaps not, and uh, one, both of them were under the ISIC. And so, so the point here is uh, uh, this idea that there are some jobs that have this spillover that are more than just what they pay, because they do something else for the economy. And the question is, let's not be too uh, linear in trying to say, or oh, these are the good jobs, but try to understand where is that we see those, that learning, and because then it matters for policy. Then policies that say we should not be wasting our jobs in a crisis, uh, especially these jobs, because they have this kind of spillover, then, and then it makes sense. But I think the challenge with some of these good jobs is that the productivity growth in manufacturing is so phenomenal that employment in manufacturing globally is going down. So this is one of the areas where these coordination issues of the zero sum of who is getting some of these jobs that have the, the highest spillover uh, gets into a picture. And I would like to combine that with the question on discrimination, not on age, but on gender. Uh, because one could say in many ways in developing countries, in places where gender equity has not been attained, uh, employment for women, uh, these are good jobs too. These are good jobs for development in the sense that they have spillovers in terms of voice and empowerment and agency and allocation of resources at the household level. And the question is how you do that. And one way is the legal way, and but in that respect, many countries, when you look at the, the, the legislation, are doing quite fine on paper. Uh, you mentioned projects that were in projects. That may provide demonstration effects, but it's still our own projects are a drop in, in the ocean of, uh, of development. Um, and as economists will say, well, let's try to identify where is the underlying constraint and let's try to tackle that constraint. But many of these problems have so many institutional, social, cultural issues underneath that it's very difficult to tackle one of them. But I think if one takes this idea that some jobs are good jobs for development, then there is a premium in trying to invest in getting more of those jobs. So equipping women to uh, work uh, in places where labor force participation is too low. It's like a first step even before you think about discrimination where one could be tackling uh, this issue. Thank you. Um, one is, yes. Yeah, uh, just because there was a question that rest, yes, that I'm just related going to, to, the ILO to be able to see the gentleman <laughs> because otherwise I won't see him. Uh, you ask where the ILO uh, develop and enforces rules to reduce discrimination and, and the answer is a, is a huge yes. I mean, this is absolutely <laughs> fundamental from you know, the foundation of the ILO in 1919, you know, the ILO constitution is really all about social justice and non-discrimination and equal opportunity. So these are, you know, the ILO is a very value-based organization and these are right there in the constitution at the beginning and through the body of legal instruments, uh, you know, through the years and decades, I would say it's mainstream in many of these legal <laughs> instruments. There are some which are directly addressed at non-discrimination. One of the core labor standards is the convention uh, on non-discrimination in employment and occupation, for instance, but there are many others. There's a convention on the rights of indigenous people. There's uh, the conve convention 122 on employment has clauses on non-discrimination. So by doing that kind of work and agreeing on this kind of rules and to the extent that countries ratify, and then of course there's the enforcement and implementation. So this is the second part of your question. Well, we work on several tracks uh, in terms of um, enforcement. Uh, one is uh, the transparency, the whole supervisory mechanism, which has its complexities and you know, ways of working from, from complaints to reports to transparency to see where there are problems. Um, we work through statistics. Uh, for instance, in the case of gender, we have the Global Employment Trends for Women, uh, which we publish uh, every year, which has some very stark contrast in different regions and countries on the different plights of women and the incorporation of women in the labor market. Um, and then we also work, of course, through the policy advice in the design of national employment policies when we support countries, issues of non-discrimination, access, equal opportunity are there. Uh, the, we have major initiatives for the disabled. In fact, we have uh, a very good project now with uh, now almost 40 multinationals, and Ronnie has been very involved in that, um, for the um, hiring and opportunities for jobs for di the disabled persons from all sorts of different dimensions, so, but very much private sector led with the support of the ILO, and also in projects. So, big topic in the ILO. Okay, Tamara, one so, small just, point just, just very want quick. To <laughs> I wanted to respond to Pierre Ellis' point, which okay. I thought was a good one in terms of looking at the package of policies, uh, because the report indeed goes policy type by policy type. 
And I just wanted to invite, I guess this is one of the benefits of putting the information in the public domain, clearly looking, you know, developing some country case studies by utilizing the database that's there would be, you know, future area fertile for research. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara. Thank you very much to um, the audience for your questions and to, to the panelists. I think this has been a very rich uh, discussion. I'm not going to try and summarize everything, but I think that uh, what has come through is the uh, issues of uh, the importance of social dialogue. But I think the overarching one probably is differentiation. Uh, amongst different countries and what it is that they can um, achieve and the issue of preparedness before crisis and so I hope that uh, this information will help uh, policymakers and other you know social actors uh, prepare themselves in the so that the next time there is a crisis uh, we are able to do better uh, with our policy interventions so thank you very much